Good afternoon, ladies from Hope and Glory. Corinne here for our, this week's coming lesson for Sunday. Of course, you can view it today if you like. Uh, but anyways, or any time that's convenient for you. I hope everyone is doing well. And I uh, thought we'd start off with um, prayer as we go to our next lesson in Proverbs. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word and the wisdom that is found in your word. And Father, I am reminded about what your word says in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17, that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, or even the woman of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So Father, I pray, Lord, during this time that I share what you have shown me through your word, share what's on my heart, that, um, that you will speak to each heart who is listening by video, and uh, Lord, they will gain something that will they can take away and practically put into practice. And ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so our uh, lesson today is called Pleasing God, and it's taken out of Proverbs 15, verse starts with verse 33, which is the very last verse in Proverbs 15, and then we're going to go through 16, verse 11. And it's interesting, they actually, the Leader's Guide had us um, put some of these, these in, I don't know, in sets? not quite sure why but as i'm going through this i can see how they could be put into sets in the way they did but anyway let's start off with this question and just kind of put on your imagination hats for a minute imagine you're at the airport and you see a child waiting for his mom she's been out of town for a week now mom steps into sight as she comes into the waiting area the child sees her and takes off, running towards her, as his mom holds her arms open wide to receive him. What a precious scene that is. Well, just as a child runs to his mother, so we should run to our Heavenly Father with our eyes totally focused on him and his open arms. Children, you know, often enjoy pleasing the people they love. They enjoy showing affection to their parents, grandparents, and even teachers at school. They might write letters or they may make drawings or do something sweet to show their affection for those that they love. Well, this desire to please often prompts them to do things that they think will please those they love. When you were a child, think about how you try to please the people you loved. What difference did it make to you? You were happy to do it, weren't you? Well, in healthy relationships, we consider how to love others for their benefit. Sometimes it may mean giving of our time, our talent, and resources. In other words, we make sacrifices on their behalf. In Proverbs, we learn that people in a healthy relationship with God seek to please him love is the motivating factor as well as recognizing our own accountability to him as his children pleasing god is not a sacrifice of our own happiness instead attitudes and actions that please god actually lead to experiencing peace joy contentment and fulfillment. Pleasing God is not a way for us to become more acceptable to him, nor is it a way to earn his affection or make him love you more. In Christ, you are already accepted by God, and his love for you is unconditional and overflowing. Pleasing God actually means living life where our thoughts 
attitudes, words, and actions are in agreement with his moral standards that are found in his word. Pleasing God acknowledges his goodness, love and kindness, compassion, mercy, and because of that, our desire is to reflect the character of his son to others. Now, as a believer, you were saved for a purpose, not just to have an entry ticket into heaven and escape the punishment of hell. There is more to being a Christ follower than that. That purpose is actually twofold. To glorify God, which means to demonstrate to the unseen and seen world, those around us, the greatness of our God, what he is like because of his forgiveness, his grace, truth, and great love and holy character. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. We were made to glorify God and to please him by becoming more like his son, Jesus Christ, as he transforms our hearts to reflect what he is like. Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Brethren. That's not too well, sorry. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 9-10, I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible. Therefore, whether we are at home, on earth, or away from home, and with him, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to him. For we, believers, will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. So the only way to even begin to please our Heavenly Father is to humble ourselves before him. Our text today actually begins with that thought. We're going to see this in Wisdom Demonstrated, Proverbs 15, 33. The reverence or the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. And then 16.8, which we'll also be looking at, better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. So point A under outline one, the beginning and essence of wisdom. Now Proverbs 9.10 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So just as the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear or reverence for God is what wisdom teaches us. Having a reverential, deep respect for God's awesome essence, the greatness of his power, his magnificent and beautiful holiness, this is what wisdom teaches. Fear of God is the core of wisdom. We are insignificant in comparison to our holy and righteous God. He is the creator. We are the created. Therefore, his authority is already clearly established. So in order to respond to that authority with wisdom, you must have an accurate knowledge of God. How? Do you view God? How you view him, what you believe about him, will affect how you live before him. Our knowledge of God comes from the scriptures, not from our experiences. I have found often, people often view God through the lens of what they have experienced in life. Our perspective of even our experiences have been twisted by faulty thinking, 
due to our own sin nature. God defines and describes himself through the word of God. God's word is where we need to look to even begin to have an accurate view and knowledge of God. The more accurate a view of God you have through the lens of scripture, the more you will come to have a reverential fear of him. This puts you in the heart position of humility before God. Now, humility is needed. That's letter B on our outline. Humility recognizes and acknowledges that he truly deserves our worship, our praise, our loyalty, our obedience, and our love. We must have a humble, teachable heart that acknowledges our full dependence on him and his instructions. Humility is the channel from which wisdom is received. Humility acknowledges that God is supreme. His wisdom is far above anything we can imagine or understand. Because of, because of his rule in our lives, because of that, sorry, his rule in our lives is to be honored, respected, and followed. His ways are best beyond our understanding of what we think is truly blessed or best. It is God who lifts us up to a place of honor when we have humbled ourselves before him. Now, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, it says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, then he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care or anxiety on him because he cares for you. Humility is the opposite of pride. Just as humility shows itself in a number of ways, so does pride. Just And I've attached actually two PDF files to help you discover how pride can be identified in your own life. The reason I gave out these two is because one or the other has something on it that the other doesn't, or maybe it's worded a different way. So when you think of humility, as you go through these, first of all, you'll be looking at pride, but think that humility is the exact opposite of what is being described as a prideful heart. Now we're gonna look at righteousness and injustice. Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. God's wisdom teaches us how to live a righteous and holy life. There is great spiritual wealth that comes with wisdom, even though a person may not possess great wealth or financial wealth, whether it's material or whatever. Jesus spoke of the impossibilities of those who have great wealth to enter into heaven. In Matthew 19, 23 through, 40, through 24, it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And this is similar to Mark 10:25. And Luke 18, 25. In this particular context, he had just spoken to the rich young ruler and pretty much nailed what the rich young ruler's idol was. And the rich young ruler, his idol was his money, and he turned away. But there's a really big commentary that I found on this on the questions.org website. And it says this Jesus' message is clear. It is impossible for anyone to be saved on his own merits. Since wealth was seen as proof of God's approval, it was commonly taught by the rabbis that rich people were blessed by God and were, therefore, the most likely candidates for heaven. Jesus destroyed that notion 
and along with it, the idea that anyone can earn eternal life. The disciples had the appropriate response to this startling statement. They were utterly amazed and asked, who then can be saved in the next verse? If the wealthy among them, which included the super spiritual Pharisees and scribes, were unworthy of heaven, what hope was there for a poor man? Well, Jesus' answer is the basis of the gospel. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God, Matthew 19, 26. Men are saved through God's gifts of grace, mercy, and faith. Nothing we do earns salvation for us. It is the poor in spirit who inherit the kingdom of God. Those who recognize their spiritual poverty and their utter inability to do anything to justify themselves to a holy God. The rich man so often is blind to his spiritual poverty because he is proud of his accomplishments and has contented himself with his wealth. He is as likely to humble himself before God as a camel is to crawl through the eye of a needle. End quote. So the contrast in this Proverbs is having little in the way of earthly wealth, but having the righteousness of God versus having a great amount of wealth gained by injustice. Injustice may be any type of wealth gained dishonestly or illegally. The poor and worldly wealth person who is righteous is a lot better off in those who have great wealth and no righteousness. It, usually, it is usually the rich and powerful who use their influence to oppress others. Now I pulled a commentary out of David Gusick's um, commentary on this, and he says, vast revenues without justice can never give a peaceful conscience, freedom from guilt and sin, the love and joy of God, and a hundred other things the righteous enjoy. Now in James 2, he rebuked those who were showing partiality to the rich in their gatherings and ignoring or treating with contempt the poor in their midst. Listen to what he says in James 2, 1 through 7. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you in court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Now let's look at our second point in our outline. Accountability established. Proverbs 16.1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. On Proverbs 16.4-5. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now we're going to look at A, planes of the heart. In verses 1 and verse 9, the plans of a man's heart and mind are referenced here. Man is responsible for what his heart plans. God knows the intentions and motives of the heart. Man because he is made in the image of God, obviously has the ability to make plans. 
those plans stem from what his heart thinks about. They can be good and noble as a person thinks about what would please God and makes his plans in accordance to God's will. Or those plans can be evil and damaging if one does not even consider God. James 4, 13 through 17 actually expounds on the arrogance of making plans without acknowledging God in the planning process. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But it, as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So the sovereignty of God is tied into man's plans. There is nothing that man can plan and do outside the control of God. God directs man's steps. David Guzik's commentary also includes some thoughts from other preachers on this subject. First, I'm going to read what he wrote. For the Lord directs his steps. We plan as we can and should, but we should never think that our ability to plan makes us lord over our lives. It is the Lord who directs our steps. Every plan we make should be held in humility before God and in surrender to his ultimate will. Now, as a preacher named Morgan, he states, a man can and does devise his own way under the direction of his heart. If desire be evil, the way devised is evil. If desire be good, the way devised is good. But that is not all the truth about life. This is also true. Jehovah directed his steps. That is to say that no man can step outside the government of God. No man can devise a way that enables him to escape from God. And then another preacher by the name of Ross states, this is true with both good and bad plans. The point is the contrast between what we actually plan and what actually happens. God determined that. As Paul later said, God is able to do abundantly more than we ask or think. And that's Ephesians 3.20. The second point in verse 1 is a person who answers according to what he or she has reflected on. If they are wise, will answer with wisdom from the Lord. Only God can help a person give a proper answer to any situation, including what has planned in his heart. Now let's look at letter B on our outline, accountable before God. And that's found in Proverbs 16, 4 through 5. Whether it be making plans by giving an answer or, or by giving an answer, everyone is accountable for what they think say and do the lord has made everything for its own purpose you know the astounding thing is that god even uses evil and wicked men for his purpose god does not create nor is he the author of evil nor does he create evil people god is pure holy and righteous evil is abhorrent to him James 1.13 tells us, let no one say when he is tempted, meaning he is tempted to sin, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. It has always been man's choice to either submit to God and obey him by living in dependence on him and his wisdom, or to reject him and live independently from him according to their own simple plans which stem from a wicked heart. The wicked do have a role to play in God's sovereign plans. 
God has appointed the wicked to experience his everlasting wrath on the day of wrath. God's perfect justice displays his holiness, his power, his righteousness. In verse 5, it says, Everyone who is proud and arrogant in heart is disgusting and exceedingly offensive to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. The wicked are proud and arrogant in heart, as they are completely against the rule of God over their lives. It is because of Satan's pride, as I have stated previously in other lessons, that God kicked him out of heaven because he wanted to rule over God. It is pride that keeps people from submitting their lives to Christ, thus rejecting eternal life. It is proud people who are wicked, who think wicked thoughts, say wicked and damaging words, do wicked deeds. Self-righteousness, by the way, is a form of pride, and you can really see it in lost people. They refuse to admit or accept the fact of their own sinful thoughts and behavior. They're so quick to point out others' flaws and criticize, but refuse to look at the log of sin in their own eyes. Unfortunately, this self-righteousness can show up in the heart of God's people, especially if they have an unbiblical view of God, self, and others. Self-righteousness has no place in the heart of a Christian. That is where those two PDFs I gave out will help you. I have reflected on those handouts so that I will be able to identify pride in my own life. God expects humility, compassion, mercy, and a forgiving heart. Pride is extremely disgusting to God. And those who are proud will be punished by God. Now let's take a look at let number three on our outline. Motives matter. Proverbs 16.2 All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight. But the Lord weighs the motives. Proverbs 16.10-11 A divine decision is in the lips of the king. His mouth should not err in judgment. A just balance in scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. Now first we're going to look at God examines motives. Remember Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct according to what their deeds deserve. Without the illumination of the Spirit of God, using the Word of God, our ways may seem pure, noble, innocent, and right to us. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 reminds us, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God knows exactly what the motives of our heart are. He evaluates and examines our hearts and knows the truth about who we really are inside, and our hearts are laid bare before him. He exposes our unbiblical and ungodly motive through his word, so that we may see, understand, repent, and renew our minds with his word and do things with godly motives. James 1, 22-23 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, but not and not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. For Christians, our heart motives are to be changed by God. He has given us the Holy Spirit, and His Spirit has given us new life and new hearts. Yes, we are a work in progress. It's called sanctification, and as long as we and we are on this lifelong journey into being changed into the likeness of Christ, our changed hearts need to be reflected in our interactions with others, such as family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, and yes, even the lost. How has the Spirit of God, using the Word of God, been changing your hearts, perspective, and motives? Are you allowing God to make those changes and participating with Him in making those changes? It's not a let go and let God. It's a partnership between you and God. Now, motives in governmental rule. Rulers in government, in many ways, represent the authority of God. God is a just God, and he expects those in leadership position to exact justice his way and decree righteous decrees. A wise king would decree righteous judgments and make decisions based on what is best for the kingdom and what lines up with the will of God. Bottom line, if a ruler is in a right relationship with the Lord, his success will be based on that relationship and relying on God's wisdom to rule. His motives would be pleasing to the Lord. On the other hand, the scripture is very clear about those who rule unrighteously. Isaiah 10, 1 through 2 says, Woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Then in Isaiah 5, 20 through 21, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight now let's take a look at motives in business the same can be said for those in business or commerce God expects honesty in business dealings. During Solomon's time, merchants would weigh gold and silver their customers brought to them to pay for goods. An unscrupulous and dishonest merchant would manipulate the scales and balances so they could charge more for their products without the customer knowing. They basically stole from their customers. Dishonesty reveals greed as the motive of their heart. This obviously does not please the Lord and reveals their lack of godly wisdom. Greed also reveals their idolatrous heart. God's people are encouraged, as Colossians 3, 5-7 says, Therefore, put to death what belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed which is idolatry because of these god's wrath comes on the disobedient and you once walked in these things when you were living in them now let's take a look at blessings assured the very last point on our outline proverbs 16 3 commit your works to the lord and your plans will be established in proverbs 16 7 6 through 7 by loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. First, commit your activities. 
whether you're planning a trip to on va for vacation or to the grocery store. Do you commit those activities to the Lord? This verse is about giving your life, thus your activities to the Lord, and allowing Him to have control over your plans and the outcome. Do your plans or the making of your plans glorify your Father in heaven? Do your daily activities reflect your dependence on the Lord in every area of your life? Or are you living for your own agenda? Our making plans and carrying them out demonstrate the need for us to have a right relationship with the Lord by trusting in Him. The Lively Commentary says, the giving over of one's thinking and acting to the Lord controls Lord's control, assures the believer that God's blessing will follow. Jesus Christ taught his followers by teaching and, and an example to pray for God's will to be done through them rather than their own plans. That's in Matthew 6, 10 through 11 and 26 through 39. The Apostle Paul wrote, we take every thought captive to obey Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Are you taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, even in your planning? Now be a life that pleases God. First, we look at sins forgiven. It is God's mercy and truth through the shed blood of Christ that brings salvation, the atoning of our sins. The Old Testament picture of Christ is in the sacrificial system. The priests would, would offer a sacrifice for sins on a yearly basis. Leviticus 17.11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Christ is our high priest and has offered himself once and for all by shedding his blood to pay for our sins. Hebrews 9, 22. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. David Guzik writes, In mercy and truth, atonement is provided. God in his mercy and truth has provided atonement for iniquity. God's mercy prompted the great sacrifice of Jesus, Messiah, on the cross. And his truth made it necessary to atonement in a way that honored the righteousness of God. Now, this may be misunderstood as if a man, by showing mercy and acting according to the truth, could atone for his own iniquity. That's incorrect. The Hebrew text is not ambiguous. And uh, Adam Clark, this is part of his um, commentary. I did read his full commentary on this. He, he uh, writes out the Hebrew text, and I cannot pronounce it for the life of me. Okay, so I'm not going to. But it basically means, by mercy and truth, he shall atone for iniquity. He, God, by his mercy, in sending his son, Jesus, into the world, shall make atonement for iniquity according to his truth. The word which he declared by his holy prophets since the world began. Now, to fair paraphrase a thought from Bridges, mercy engages, truth fulfills. The ransom is provided by mercy and accepted by truth. Both sat together in the eternal council. And Jesus both entered into the world together. Now, some commentators believe that this breath refers to man's mercy and truth but are careful to point out that it does not teach the idea of self-atonement or self-salvation. The second line indicates that the mercy and truth um, are man's here, not God. This is not a denial of grace, but a characteristic demand for fruits that befit repentance. In other words, the characteristics of true repentance in the heart of, of a person reveal the fruit of repentance. A life that has been shown mercy will demonstrate mercy to others. A life that has been changed by the love and truth of God will walk and live in that truth and demonstrate that love and truth to others. 
a life that is overwhelmed by the faithfulness of God will be loyal to him. All this is from God and begins with his saving grace. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the ages to come, he might show the, the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, as we have read in previous verses, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is that fear that leads to a God-honoring life. When you have right fear for, of the Lord, you will depart from evil. You won't want to participate in evil, but shun it. Now, we're going to look at the peace of God. This general principle is that a life that honors God brings peace to the individual. Often a gracious life, God-honoring life, will even affect one's enemies. That is why Jesus said to love our enemies and do good to them who persecute you. In Matthew 5, 43-45, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And Luke 6, 27-28, But I say to you, but I, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who mistreat you. And then in Luke 6, 34-36, If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Why? Because Jesus loved us even while we were his enemies. He did good to us and for us by dying on the cross to pay the penalty of death we deserved. He initiated providing the way of peace and reconciliation to God through himself. We also know that Christ's followers will be persecuted. So this does not contradict scripture. And even in the middle of persecution, a person who has peace with God will experience the peace of God. Philippians 4, 5-7 give us some words of encouragement. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I really like what the Leader's Guide says here. The Lord works through his people, so we will live in a way that silences even the worst critics of our eagerness to please him. And I'm reminded of two scriptures. One is in Titus 2, verse 6 to 8. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. And this actually can apply to every single one of us. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. 
And then in 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So in summary, the only way to please, to glorify and please God begins with humbling ourselves before him. We need to be willing to submit every area of our lives to it. In doing so, he will give us wisdom we need to make decisions in a life that pleases him. His wisdom is found in his word. Doing life God's way brings peace, freedom, purpose, fulfillment, and contentment. It also reflects how God is transforming us into the image of Christ. So my challenge for you this week, use the PDFs for your own self-examination and to help you grow in Christ-likeness. Determine to allow God to fill every area of your life. I do hope that this has been helpful for you. It's a consistent reminder to me and I'm thankful for God's word and I'm thankful for each one of you who are willing to turn on your computer or your phone and um, access this video of lessons. The Lord is good. May God bless you in every single endeavor you have. Love you. See you soon.